the steel industry and stainless steel among them is one of the largest emitters of CO2 in the world. So obviously if one wants to solve the climate question during our, our lifetime and hopefully sooner, the industry, the stainless and the steel industry has to find a solution. And I, I know there's a lot of work ongoing at the moment, but I think one of the main challenges is that all the different players in the industry, whether it's suppliers, companies themselves or our customers, really have to get on the bandwagon together. At the moment, our target is to reduce our emissions by 42% by the end of this decade. We are halfway on that journey. We have a number of things we have to do, but I can see the light ahead of the in the tunnel, so to speak, to that milestone. And then getting to full decarbonization, of course, will take some more time. But personally, I, I feel that being here today, it is to show commitment from our company to others in our sort of you know, ecosystem that you know, we're doing the right thing and then let's work together to find, find solutions. So. The biggest piece of the puzzle is energy, it makes up 73%. So what excites me to your point is really the speed we can add like when it comes to achieving energy efficiency and decarbonization 10x faster. And I, you know, especially when it comes to the hard to decarbonize sectors such as steel, Super excited about the work we are doing with Finnish players like an Autocompo uh, to slash energy use, to slash emissions profitably. Right, so bringing, bringing dispersed data sets, data sources together from different factories, different machines, different locations, all into one unified data estate. And the numbers speak for themselves. So one of our, one of our biggest learning has been that in, in this sector, it's not just enough for us to do and make the best technology which has to be energy efficient, but it's also helping our customers and helping our, our value chain. Uh, because until our customers decarbonize their energy consumption for their base stations, we don't achieve our scope 3 targets. 95% of our scope 3 uh, is, is actually uh, in category 11, which is the use of our products. We did a study and we, we realized that uh, so far, with the, the first wave of internet revolution over the last 30 years, we have pretty much digitalized 30% of the economy, you know, media, technology, banking, and so on. The <laughs> remaining 70% by, by employment is actually what we call as physical industries. Mm. A lot about the, the steel industry, manufacturing, transportation. And in that sector, what we are realizing is what gets measured gets acted upon. And basis of measurement is digitalization. And it's not just about the innovating with the customers, but also our upstream value chain. Many of our um, you know, manufacturing partners, mm. many of the, the, the aluminum suppliers and the component suppliers are also innovating hard to go into low carbon materials. And we are working very closely with our upstream suppliers as well, because until this entire value chain innovates together, um, I don't think the innovation works across the table. So I would say number one is the is the is the demand uh, by the customers of, of our our clients. I mean, we are just in the service industry. We are making things possible together with our customers. Number two is technology. I, I genuinely think that the ultimate solution to the cleaner and greener future is technology. Now, as a bank, I think for us the beauty is that we see development across the whole value chain. So, but is there a risk that you just, you know, you, you put some money there, you put some money there, and then you put some money there, and then there is no coherence, really? Uh, hard to abate uh, is something that we pay special attention to. When, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, end of 21, we actually approved a new strategy where we said we are willing to take a little bit more risk for bigger impact. And we specifically uh, took note of the hard to abate sectors and we did the same again when we got our sustainability policy approved we do the same again tomorrow morning when we launch our our, uh, our climate strategy we basically say we're basically also taking a reputational risk on ourselves <laughs> that if we do go into those sectors then initially we might even see our own indirect uh, financed emissions uh, increasing but we say that's okay because ultimately on the accumulated global basis we're still doing the right thing and we go where perhaps the, uh, the impact is the biggest. I'm a very big believer in data transparency. In the steel industry what we basically today see is that regulatory frameworks are very much focusing on the supply side. The Neste is the world's leading producer of sustainable aviation fuel. 
In that industry, the regulatory framework focuses on the demand side. So you're basically, through in right. incentives and regulation, you are, you're creating demand for the product. And in, in our sector, you're not really creating demand. So our customers don't really have any, any incentive unless they personally decide to do that, really to, to, to push, to increase the demand. And I think we're going to have a problem here that we have a supply, supply side uh, you know, offering, but we don't have the demand pull. I'd like to see the regulatory frameworks move also to consider the demand side as well. And we hear that a lot here in many of these events that the demand side need to pay this green premium for the industry to be able to actually uh, transform like on a large scale. And uh, I would like to ask all of you what your best advice would be to sort of approach this whole value chain perspective that you would go all the way from the supply side to the demand side and get this transition sort of speeding up on a broad scale. And deploying the right hardware technologies, data and AI will make this, um, will optimize and make sure this happens a lot faster. And I think for me, to make that happen, right, it's all about doing your, your data homework first. Right? There is no AI without data. So it all starts with getting your data estate in order because without that, right, you won't be able to unlock those cost savings, you won't be able to unlock those insights you were talking about, you won't be able to unlock new revenue streams with AI. It all starts with aggregating a ton of environmental, operational, financial data into one unified data estate. Building your data strategy doesn't have to be daunting. You can start small. You know, I think it all starts with, with focusing on that one use case, the most pressing use case you have for sustainability, cleaning up only that data, and then you can use that to inform your broader data transformation strategy and help you scale faster later on. I would like to make one more point here, because you mentioned a, a, a word that is probably the word and particularly close to my heart, which is transparency. In the end of the day, Right, this all boils down to this. Any CEO, any CFO has that top of their mind when it comes to sustainability because it's a big deal for their investors and their shareholders because they have to get their ESG score right. And I can tell you, investors are now paying a premium for companies who can offer genuine transparency yeah. on how they got from yeah. it. But if I take that to the consumer world and, and with um, asset intensive industry, one of the thought process that comes to my mind in terms of possible stimulation uh, is, is perhaps stimulating and incentivizing circularity. Think about if consumers are, are incentivized based on the ability to recycle their washing machines or the products they, they own. It may, be, it may be a faster way to incentivize the consumption of, of materials like steel and other materials that consumers own instead of um, incentivizing for making, you know, making them purchase decisions based on green because some industries have tried to incentivize consumer purchase decisions based on green and I would say that that progress has been rather slow. I would not necessarily agree that, that the producers are not making an effort. We see that quite substantially happening across the different industries. Um, and I think that's good news and that it is a gradual process. You cannot, you know, have a product that nobody buys, which is a perfect clean and green and, mm. uh, but it's too expensive for anybody to buy. So it's, a, it's always a gradual process. I think each of these different uh, actors in that uh, supply chain would have to basically gradually take the next step and I like the fact that what gets measured gets done mm. and I like the fact that some of it you can also incentivize by regulations but of course uh, you know it's good if the market itself regulates and, and, the, and that it's the demand that incentivizes rather than p just the pure regulations but I, I think regulation is also and the reporting standards is an important issue as well. So I think that would be my call to action as well. Let's rethink the cre green premium as an innovation premium. I want to leave you with one sort of one statement and one sort of question and my statement really is that you know obviously the green transition I mean this is not for free. Mm. I mean that we cannot decarbonize without a cost. I mean, there's a very fundamental question on who is ultimately going to, you know, how are you going to try to sort of distribute that cost and how do you create value, you know, for, for justifying the investments.
Now is a moment when leaders really have to show commitment to this journey because I can guarantee you that if I look around the planet, there are a lot of forces which will say, hey, let's park this. We have the other things on the table we have to deal with first. And I think now is the moment when senior executives and leaders have to, you know, stick their stick on the stay on the road and push forward. So that would be my commitment, you know, to, to stay on the stay of the course.